the past few weeks, I have compared the impeachment inquiry to a lot of things. A fiery meteor, a stone fruit, delicious. <laughs> but this week, I thought you should think of impeachment as a fun house at a carnival. You know, the creepy ones full of trick mirrors. So how do we get out of this house of terror? That's where I come in. Let's do this. Let's start here as we do every week, lightning round style. The five impeachment stories you need to know about in just 30 seconds. Here we go. A majority of Americans support impeachment and the removal of President Donald Trump, according to a new Gallup poll. A grand jury has subpoenaed former Texas Congressman Pete Sessions on matters connected to Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani. Gordon Sondland has talked to Congress and threw blame at Trump and Giuliani. A senior advisor to Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has resigned and testified before Congress. And Hunter Biden, son of Joe Biden, has spoken out amidst calls of corruption in the Ukraine in an interview with ABC News. Huh. To answer all of my whistleblower questions, I'm joined by John Kostiak, who's the executive director of the National Whistleblower Center. Yes, that is a thing. John and his team work daily to support whistleblowers in their efforts to expose and help prosecute corruption and other wrongdoing. Now, prior to joining NWF, yes, everything in Washington has an acronym, it's NBD. John worked as a practicing attorney and a federal judicial clerk in Florida. Here we go. Okay, John, let's start simple. What is the lay person's best definition of a whistleblower in this government context. Okay, so a whistleblower is an individual who has information that's otherwise unknown about law breaking or other kinds of wrongdoing. And they uh, want to get into the hands of someone who can do something about it. Now, are these people typically high level employees within the government? You would presume to your point, if they want to get in the hands of someone who could do something about it, they themselves feel like they may not be the person to do something about it. Well, there is no one typical whistleblower, but there's a lot of research about whistleblowers and the people who tend to have the information that's most useful to law enforcement tend to be higher up, both within government agencies as well as corporations. When we're talking about whistleblowers, and the Ukraine whistleblower in particular, in order to get the, the information, you have to be at a certain high level, right? That's right. I mean, the, the whistleblowers who have been most effective are the ones that are, have access to information, not only that is otherwise unknown, but is of great interest to law enforcement. In this case, we have two whistleblowers, actually, who have stepped forward, and both of them have gone through the formal legal channels. These are people who are, are tell, doing what Congress asked them to do with their information. And the core idea is we want to encourage, rather than discourage, people to step forward if they have information about crime or other kinds of wrongdoing. Okay, so I want to talk about the formal process because I think it's important that people understand a formal process does exist here and that yeah. these people have followed it. And everything we have heard, including from the Inspector General of the Intelligence Communities, is these folks follow the procedures to a T. The hurdles are steeper for intelligence community whistleblowers. Hmm. Uh, for example, they can't go right to Congress with the substance of their complaint. They are allowed to tell Congress that we have a complaint, but the substance of that complaint has to go to the Inspector General uh, for the Intelligence Community. And that Inspector General reviews it, uh, determines one, is it credible, and two, does it raise an urgent concern. So at that point, the, uh, there is a deadline to submit for the uh, Director of uh, National Intelligence. That did not happen. Right. And so in this case, uh, because uh, the chair of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Congressman Schiff, was aware that this complaint existed, Congress raised the alarm bells and say, where is this complaint? How come we haven't seen it? The typical process is these things happen behind the scenes. We never hear about them. And uh, they're highly confidential. And of course, the Intelligence Committee uh, and their staff are all uh, you know, entrusted with classified information every day. And so the idea that we wouldn't trust them with this information to us was very odd. Okay, I wanna go through the two most common criticisms from Republicans of particularly the first whistleblower complaint that has gotten the most attention. This is all secondhand and you shouldn't be able, it's not I heard John say X, it's I heard that John said X, number one. And two, has the whistleblower law been changed recently? Okay. Uh, these are myths that we spend every day trying to demolish. <laughs> so okay. let's try again. Let's do it. <laughs> uh, secondhand information is extremely common in the world of whistleblowing. Those are essentially tips 
Uh, here are the people you need to go talk to who may have been direct witnesses to this event. Here are the documents you may need to gather. And getting now to your second point, mm -hmm. is this uh, allowable under the law and was a law changed to accommodate this whistleblower? That's just not true. Um, the forms that uh, uh, these whistleblowers are instructed to fill out both the, the one that existed before this whistleblower came along and the one that was changed around the time uh, of this whistleblower both indicate with you know clear language secondhand information is acceptable who's the whistleblower who is the whistleblower we have to know donald trump has tweeted and said he deserves to know the identity and to meet his Accuser. Is there any possibility that would happen? Well, there's a great irony here. I think by the president's very comments makes it less likely that he will ever get to meet this whistleblower or know the existence of this whistleblower. So then the question is, is do we have any obligation, to, the, the Congress have any obligation to introduce the president to this whistleblower? And the answer is no. Um, the, the, the whistleblower uh, has provided information that has led to an investigation and there's a whole bunch of new information that has come forward. So uh, since the whistleblower complaint was put forward, we now have a, a abundant additional documentary as well as witness testimony that could form the basis for whatever impeachment action uh, Congress takes. And I, I think your point, and I didn't know this until we talked, don't think of the whistleblower necessarily as a star witness. Think of them as the tip provider in a lot of ways. They're the start of this, not necessarily the end of it. Is that fair? That's right. And I think the people who have had direct access to the decision makers here, um, the, the, the recent uh, witnesses uh, such as Ambassador Hill from the uh, State Department, mm -hmm. are the ones who are probably going to be the ones that are most uh, needed by the investigators to really get to the bottom of what happened here. It is highly unusual and inappropriate for any government official to even make an implicit threat to the health of a whistleblower, and we think it's deeply wrong. We encourage whistleblowers, we want to protect them. We actually need to continue to strengthen protection so people feel safer to step forward. Thank you, John. Okay. Hey, thank you. And that is the point on impeachment. Make sure to check back every weekend for the latest news you need to know, plus a deep dive into something you might not understand about the efforts to impeach President Donald Trump.